how to start connecting markets more thoroughly. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing here in this, in this section, is thinking about how markets are all coordinated. So far, we've generally dealt with the concept of partial equilibrium, which basically just thinks about individual markets and how they work. Okay, so we could think about the market for housing, we could think about the market for savings and loans, um, but we can think about that individually, okay? Disconnect those markets. What we're doing now is general equilibrium. Which thinks about universal equilibrium and the connection of markets. Kind of the concept here is that all markets um, in some ways will be connected for the most part. All right, so practically all markets are connected. So if something happens in one market, it will interconnect to so many markets that just about all markets are impacted. Um, and kind of a nice analogy to me is, is to think about the animal kingdom when it comes to this type of, of, of thought process. Uh, so imagine, for example, that we suddenly killed off all the hawks that exist in Milledgeville. That would create this chain reaction, this huge chain reaction. Um, if all the hawks are gone, we're going to get way more rabbits and way more squirrels and mice because they don't have to compete, uh, or rather they don't have to uh, worry about getting eaten by hawks. Um, as those mice and everything thrive, you're going to get probably more snakes because the snakes are going to be able to eat the mice and everything else. Uh, as a result of more snakes, you might have more venomous snakes. More venomous snakes means more snake bites, which means that hospitals are going to need to have more antidotes ready. Th that's kind of the idea of general equilibrium theory, is how you can connect lots of things together to think about how all the markets are, are impacted. Uh, theoretically, this works very well. The lessons that we're going to go through make a lot of sense. Um, however... Testing, these theories are really tricky because as, as, all, as is often the case in economics, um, Sandler's Paribus doesn't actually occur. So if we think about how something affects or how something changes, for example, if, if all the hawks are suddenly killed, um, the problem is when that occurs, there's probably a lot of other stuff that are happening. So it might be difficult to see how that affects the number of antidotes that a hospital needs because there's just so many moving parts, so many other things that are actually changing. And that's what you're going to see here with general equilibrium theory and economics as well. Um, when there are so many markets that we're discussing in these questions, it's impossible to isolate individual effects. But that is the goal of general equilibrium theory. If we truly had ceteris paribus, if, tr if truly nothing else changed, we can think about all of the impacts that would occur from one initial change, okay? So we'll start with a really easy example, the type of example that you did in, in micro, principles of micro. And I just kind of want you to see why, right away that this is, not, this is not new material for you, okay? We're just putting a new name to it and we're gonna expand upon it. Um, you guys have seen these types of markets before. So for example, if the price of peanuts goes up, let's think about the impacts. So maybe it's a really bad weather year for peanuts. So it's hard to produce peanuts, um, so peanut prices go up. That's going to affect many markets. For example, the market for peanut butter, without a doubt, will be affected. Um, in the market for peanut butter, what we would expect to see is, as the price of peanuts goes up, producers have a harder time producing peanut butter. So the supply would shift to the left, leading to higher prices and a reduced quantity. All right. Uh, so th the connection there, I think, is pretty clear. Peanuts are an input in peanut butter. So those markets will be connected. Let's take that now to another level. So we might think of this as the first level of effect. Let's take that now to a second level of effect. The market for jelly. In the market for jelly, consumers now see 
that peanut butter is more expensive. And since consumers tend to buy these two things together, they're complements, right? When the price of peanut butter goes up and people buy less peanut butter, they also will not buy as much jelly, okay? So demand for jelly would go down. And the result is lower prices and lower quantity. Okay, so that, that's the premise of general equilibrium theory is we can connect these markets together. And it, it wouldn't stop here. It would continue and continue and continue, okay? So we can take this another step further. How about the market for ham? Well, you know, we, there's no way to know for sure, right? And this is where it starts getting a little more hazy as you connect to more and more markets. But probably, if people are buying fewer peanut butter and jelly combinations, they're probably buying other types of sandwich materials, right? So the demand for ham, maybe that increases, right? If, if people aren't buying peanut butter and jelly, then maybe they're buying more ham, okay? So demand for ham goes up, leading to higher price and higher quantity, all right? We can continue on with this. What do, what do people feed pigs? Sometimes they feed pigs corn, right? So like low-grade corn. Well, if the price of ham goes up, then that means it's more profitable to produce ham. So farmers are gonna to respond to that by wanting to farm more pigs. And to farm more pigs, you need more corn to feed them. So the demand for corn would go up, leading to higher prices and higher quantity, okay? Um, here's the thing though, corn is a resource that we use to produce uh, gas, right? Different types of uh, gas and, and electrical uh, components are needed for, uh, corn's needed for that. So if you're producing like, I think ethanol, right? Uses corn sometimes. So this is gonna actually raise electricity prices and gas prices potentially, right? So uh, as gas prices go up as a result of this, people are gonna then switch to other forms of, uh, of power, all right? So the result here is, as corn becomes more expensive, you'll have a reduction in the supply of gas, all right? It'll be harder to produce ethanol forms of gas, so supply would shift to the left, leading to higher prices and lower quantities for gas. People then will look for alternative ways to get uh, power, so maybe people will buy more electrical vehicles, so the price of electricity would go up, and we could just continue on and on with this, okay? That, that's the idea of general equilibrium theory. And, you know, on the exam, I'm not gonna take you all out to these multiple levels to such an extreme, um, but there are some specific cases where general equ equilibrium theory really makes a lot of sense and where it's really important, okay? So let's do one more example, and then I'm gonna take you to a real-world example that is extremely relevant for us. So, as a second example here, let's go back to the price of gas, and let's just say that the price of gas goes up for whatever reason, okay? And this would be a really good one to think about with uh, general equilibrium theory, because the price of gas is directly connected to so many markets, right? So you could sort of imagine how this would affect tons and tons of different markets. Okay, so if the price of gas goes up, the immediate response is people will buy fewer automobiles. So demand for automobiles will go down. Now you might be thinking, well, what about electric vehicles? Yeah, um, this probably would affect electric vehicles. You probably get more demand for electric vehicles. But the problem is, there's only so many electric vehicles that are produced, so it'll actually take quite a while before uh, we can produce enough electric vehicles to meet demand. So the immediate response is, if the price of gas, let's say, doubles, people are going to look for alternative methods. They're going to walk to work, bike to work, they're going to maybe live closer to work, um, use public transportation. There's a lot of things they could do, okay? Um, but one thing we can be pretty sure of is they're going to immediately buy fewer automobiles, okay? Um, so as a result of this, we can think about the market for auto loans. And 
And let's think about this as a savings market. Okay, so we could, we could think price and quantity, but I think in this case, using an interest rate model makes a lot more sense. So auto loans, you have savers, you have borrowers. The borrowers are the people that are trying to borrow money to buy a car. And the savers are people that are lending to those people. Okay, and banks facilitate this. So you can kind of think of savers as being anybody with a checking account or a savings account, right? If you put money in a checking account, it's quite feasible that that money ends up being loaned out for the purchase of a vehicle, okay? So the result of this is there's going to be a reduced demand to borrow money, right? A reduction in the borrowing curve here. And this is relevant because it drives down interest rates. And as we've seen many times in this class, interest rates are all interconnected, okay? So less money is being loaned in this market. That means there's more money available to be lent in other markets. Interest rates are going down for auto loans. You would expect to see interest rates to go down for other markets as well. And so this effect is gonna bleed into the housing market, okay? So what we might expect to see in the market for housing loans, there's now more money available, okay? Because we have this reduction in quantity here, and because we have a reduction in interest rates here, that's gonna affect this market, okay? Basically, these are substitutes in terms of, of, in terms of saving, okay? So you've got a bunch of money available that you wanna lend out. Well, lending here is no longer a very good option because interest rates are lower. So that's gonna increase the likelihood of lending in other markets. And so the result is interest rates for housing loans go down and the quantity of loanable funds goes up. So effectively people would be borrowing more money now to buy houses. So now that's gonna directly affect housing, okay? Remember we started with gas. So gas prices go up, people buy fewer cars, Therefore, they're borrowing less, all right? You see that right here, that decrease in quantity. Since interest rates are lower for auto loans, banks will begin lending more money to other outside sources. So for example, for housing loans, so you get a higher quantity here. And since people are borrowing money, and since interest rates here are lower, you're gonna get an increased demand for housing. So housing prices would go up and the quantity would go up, all right? And you can see how something like the price of gas bleeds into many, many, many different markets, okay? Conceptually, this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I mean, it makes theoretical sense. Again, the problem being that ceteris paribus does not really occur in the real world. There's no way to run this experiment to find out what happens. We can do some empirical work to try to get an idea of what's happening, but there's just so many moving parts. We're trying to figure out how the price of gas affects the market for housing. But if the price of gas doubled, chances are there's some other wacky stuff happening, right? If the price of gas is going up 100%, there's probably some crazy things that are connected to that that also occur. Um, maybe the price of gas goes up because we had a really big hurricane. A really big hurricane destroyed a bunch of uh, you know, uh, oil rigs out in the ocean. Well, that hurricane probably had a lot of other effects too. And so it's hard to suss out the direct effects. But as I said before, there's one very specific case where the general equilibrium theory does a really good job of explaining what happened. Specifically, let's go back to like 2005. So to see a uh, compelling example of the general equilibrium theory in practice, I don't know why I keep saying equilibrium, 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 whatever you want to say. Um, if we think about the Great Recession, and to be clear, when I say Great Recession, what we're really talking about here is like 2008 to 2010. I suspect you know a little bit about this recession already. Maybe you learned about it in like Principles of Macro or another class. Um, but you definitely did not go as in-depth as we're about to go into this subject. Um, some of the simple material I'm going to leave out, but I really want to focus on the complex part. And uh, there's a reason for that. This recession is, to me, a great one to study for this class in particular, is because this was truly 
an economic recession with financial markets being the drivers. All right, so what I mean by that is if, if you think about recessions in the past, such as the one in 2020, right? Now, 2020 was technically an economic recession because all economic, all recessions are economic recessions, right? But the 2020 recession was not a result of bad economics. It was not a result of financial mistakes. The 2020 recession, of course, was a result of COVID, which is not something that's really directly economic in nature, okay? So in that case, we have a recession because of a health crisis, all right? But this recession is an economic recession because of economic events, all right? Poor economic policies, poor financial policies created a recession. And I care a lot about this because it's obviously very important for this class to be able to understand financial consequences and, and economic recessions and such, um, but also because it's avoidable. If we had better policies, we could have avoided this recession. And maybe you could say we could have improved our scenario in 2020, but it's really hard to imagine avoiding that one. Likewise, if you go back to 2001, we had a recession in 2001 that was partially caused by 9-11. Well, I mean, that isn't really an economic event, right? That is not something that we as, as economic students could have improved, all right? But this one, this is one we could have fixed. This is one we could have dealt with in better ways. And so we're gonna learn about the causes of this recession, uh, the resulting impacts of this recession, and get a good feel for why general equilibrium theory is so relevant in discussing this. And to do that, what we really need to understand is the answer to this question. Why did housing prices rise so fast leading up to this recession? If you know anything about this recession, you know that it was driven by the housing market, right? Leading up to this period of about 2008, housing prices increased incredibly fast, okay? Between 1997 and 2007, housing prices went up about 95%, which is far exceeding inflation, okay? And housing prices, they're not like stock prices or something. They shouldn't go up that fast. Housing prices go up like 3 or 4% per year on average. They're not like stocks, which go up 10% per year on average, okay? So seeing a 95% growth over 10 years is really insane, okay? And we need to figure out why. And the first thing we're going to talk about is our relationship to China. And to get a feel for this, what I want to do right now is show you just a little bit of data. Okay, so just uh, real quickly here, just to get a feel for why the U.S.-China trade relations are going to be important here, uh, we need to understand why our exchange rates are strange. So this is normal exchange rates and what they look like. So this is the United States to the South Korean won, okay? And what you'll see here is exchange rates go up, they go down. It's all very random, right? It, it, in fact, it looks much like a random walk. Basically, there's complete, completely unpredictable changes through time. So it'll go up for a while, it'll go down for a while. It looks practically random. This is what a free market looks like. However, China does not really create a free market. China's currency historically has been devalued, which means basically they keep their currency uh, value low. All right. So when we look at the U.S. relationship with China's currency, we see this. You see these periods here where it's very flat? What that means is China basically kept their exchange rate constant. And if you know much about economics, what you know is if, if you create a, a restriction on price, that will lead to some pretty strange results, right? For example, if you, if you make an announcement that you can only pay workers exactly $20 an hour, that would have massive implications on how markets would operate. And it's no different here. If you keep currencies flat for a period of time, that's going to create all kinds of surpluses and shortages potentially in markets. Um, and even when these periods where it's moving like more fluidly, like let, let's say right in here, it looks like maybe it's not targeted to one amount, even then they were devaluing their currency, okay? 
So you, you can actually see the period where they have the longest period where it's stuck is between about 1996 or so and about 2005. So you got a good 10 years there where they kept their currency flat. Now, what do you think that would have? What, what do you think that would do? Okay, if China is keeping their currency really cheap, what would be the consequences? Okay, so as you can see there, there's pretty clear evidence that China was keeping its currency uh, too low, and there's loads of research that has shown this to be the case. That's probably not even a surprise. You've probably heard this before. But let's think about the implications. There are lots of implications. Lots of markets are going to be affected by this, but let's think on a macro scale what the impacts would be, okay? Um, if China keeps its currency devalued, then the expectation of the law of one price is certainly not going to hold, right? The, the, the concept of the law of one price is the idea that the real exchange rates would trend towards one. So over the long run, the real exchange rate in the United States would equal one, the real exchange rate in China would equal one, and that doesn't actually occur in the real world, okay, because of transaction costs. But what we have here is something beyond transaction costs, okay? And so that's going to lead to potentially really extreme differences in the real exchange rate. They can greatly vary from one. So the impact of devalued currency is that the real exchange rate in the United States is going to be really high, maybe something like three, okay? So what that basically means is if you buy something in the United States with U.S. dollars, you could have exchanged that currency to Chinese currency and then bought three of those items, okay? So it is much more expensive in the United States. Conversely, the real exchange rate for China might be something like one-third, all right? In other words, if you buy something in China, that currency would only buy a third of that good in the United States after exchanging. So it's very cheap to buy these goods in China, and it is expensive in the U.S. So what we would expect to see as a result of this, if we think about this from the U.S. perspective, what we'd expect to see is very few exports to China and lots of imports from China, right? You're buying goods in China where they're relatively cheap and you're not buying, you're not selling goods to China because U.S. goods are relatively expensive. And if I show you the data, that's exactly what you're going to see. And so that trade deficit we were talking about, you can actually see that here really well on this graph. Um, so this is not adjusted for inflation or anything, but still it's going to tell us what we really need to see. Uh, this dark line here to like the top of this graph right here, what that is showing you is China's exports to the United States, or in other words, the U.S. imports of Chinese goods. This gray line down here is U.S. exports to China, okay? The middle represents the trade deficit. So the trade deficit uh, is really big between the U.S. and China. This is by far the largest trade deficit in the world. That's not all bad, all right? Uh, a trade deficit in this case, what this means is we're getting to buy Chinese goods for a low price. That's a good thing, right? It's good to be able to buy things for a low price. But unfortunately, that had interesting consequences in the, uh, leading up, in the period leading up to the Great Recession. Uh, and let's explain why right now. So indeed, the uh, deficit was really big, and it remains really big. Uh, our trade relationship with China is very interesting. And as I said in the prior section there, it's not all bad. This is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Trade deficits can be good. Um, I have a trade deficit with Amici. They never buy anything from me. I buy things from them. That's fine. That's a mutual, mutually beneficial agreement that we have, okay? But to see such a big one year after year is certainly unusual, and it definitely will have complications. And one of the major implications of this is the effects that this will have on the housing market. So just to give you some data here, let's think 2006, right? One of the last years before the recession began. In 2006, exports to China from the United States totaled about $55 billion. 
which is a big amount, right? That's a lot of, of value to export. But on the other hand, the imports, the dollar value of the goods we purchased from China uh, is worth about $288 million, which obviously is indicative of a huge deficit. So in 2006 alone, the deficit was about $233 billion. That's big. That's a really big deficit, okay? And so basically, it, to put this into context, at the time, that, that's worth about 2% of the U.S. GDP. About 2% of the GDP of the United States um, could be represented by the deficit that we have with China, okay? So what are they going to do with that currency, okay? What we need to recognize is that this means that there is $233 billion in U.S. dollars held in China in 2006 alone. So what are they going to do with that currency? Well, they can't really spend it in China. It's U.S. dollars, you see. The fact that this is U.S. dollars is really important. They can't spend it in China for the most part. They can't really spend it in other parts of the world. They're going to have to use it back in the United States, okay? So the options when you have U.S. currency is to spend it in the United States or save it in the United States. Well, we know they're not spending it because there's a trade deficit, right? If they were spending this money, it would have been realized here as exports. So that $233 billion is money that was not spent in the U.S. So the result is it's saved in the United States. So what we have here is $233 billion in savings to the U.S., and that money can come to the United States in various forms. One thing that could be purchased is stocks. So people in China buy stocks from the United States, okay? They could also buy governmental bonds. They could buy any other type of bonds, and the list goes on and on, okay? So that money that's in China is U.S. dollars. We know it's not being spent. So it must be being saved. And so we have this huge surplus of money coming into the United States in form of savings. Okay, This is part of the reason why the United States government owes a lot of money to Chinese citizens, because they've been lending us a lot of money. That's not a bad thing, right? It's, it's a good thing. We get to borrow the money, we get to use it for various things. All right, So this is not like an, an animosity situation that we have. This can be a good thing. But this has some pretty important implications. That money is rolling in to the United States. Let's think about what that does on the market for bonds. We can think about this as just regular supply and demand. We can think about this as market for loanable funds. And this is going to tell us the same thing either way. When that money comes in from China, that's indicative of increased demand for bonds. Remember, we're not talking a small amount of money. $233 billion in 2006 alone. So, you know, add up all those years, you're talking trillions of dollars rolling in. And so the result is you get an increased price for bonds and more bonds being sold. If we conversely want to think about that as a market for loanable funds, then we can think of this as an increase in savings. The extra money rolling in is an increase in savings, which drops interest rates and increases the quantity of loanable funds. These two graphs show us the same thing, okay? Price of bonds goes up. As we know, higher price for bonds means lower interest rates. And also what you see here is a higher quantity, more bonds, more money being borrowed in the bond market. General equilibrium theory shows us that this is going to have lots of complications, lots of implications, and in this case, lots of complications, okay? This is going to create some problems. Um, if we think about how this affects the housing market, it is certainly not a great leap to simply recognize that this decrease in interest rates is going to affect the market. So clearly, interest rates 
will go down. As that money rolls in from China, that increase in loanable funds, that increase in savings that rolls in will drop interest rates down, okay? How would that affect demand for housing? If interest rates are lower, that would definitely increase demand for housing. So the result is that all that extra money coming in from China leads to greater demand for housing, higher prices, and higher quantity. And it turns out that both of these effects right here are really important in describing the Great Recession of that 2008 period. So thinking about why housing prices went up so much, particularly in the 10 years leading up to the Great Recession, we have one of those ingredients right here, which is the trade deficit with China. And remember, that one's driven by the fact that China was devaluing its currency. Okay, so that devalued currency led to more importing as U.S. customers bought Chinese goods, less exporting as fewer Chinese bought American goods, and all that extra money in China ended up being saved back into the U.S., much of that into the housing market and any other market, right? It doesn't necessarily matter if that money specifically went to the housing market. As long as it went to any type of saving market, interest rates would go down. And we know that interest rates, if they go down in one market, they tend to go down in all the other markets, okay? So people bought more houses. But that's not the only effect. Let me give you a second one now. And this is the increased availability in investing in housing. Okay? Um, so basically, if you go back to like the, the 1950s, okay, investing in the housing market in the 1950s basically meant you owned a house and you could rent it out or something, right? So you own a house in New York City, you rent it out, you're a housing investor. Nowadays, anybody can invest in the housing market. You don't need to own a house. You can invest basically with just the click of a mouse, okay? And um, that period leading up to the Great Recession, we saw this huge explosion in the types of investments that people could choose. Okay, so basically, if you imagine a whole bunch of houses, and these houses are all over the country, these are supposed to be little drawings of houses here. Um, if you imagine all these houses, there are potential ways to invest. You could do the traditional route, you could own one of these homes, right? If you own one of these homes, you could rent it out, you were then a housing investor. But that's not necessarily all that viable for most people. You might not have enough money to buy a house. Most people don't, okay? And secondly, you might not want to own just one house because that is a very undiversified investment, right? That asset is very undiversified. It's extremely risky. So rather than owning one home, rather than owning 100% of one home, it might be better to own like 1% of 100 homes. And so we began to see an increase in mortgage-backed securities, which basically just take these houses, put them into a big folder of investments, and then sell off little pieces, okay? So if you buy one share of a mortgage-backed security, what you're doing is you're buying a, a teeny tiny little piece of a whole bunch of houses. And again, these are called mortgage-backed securities. Just an investment option. Where the buyer, all right, in this case, the buyer is the saver, right? They're buying these bonds, so really just bonds, all right? They're buying these bonds, so they are saving money into this market. And this is an investment option where buyers can invest in houses. And the popularity of this, the creation of these mortgage-backed securities and the popularity of these mortgage-backed securities um, really ramped up in the period leading up to the Great Recession. Essentially, if housing prices are always going up, then these are going to be really good investments. All right. There's two things that can happen with a housing mortgage. One is that the people borrowing the money can keep making all their payments. 
That's good, right? You'll get some of the interest. That's the way these mortgage-backed securities work. If these houses are all paying 4% interest on their mortgage, and you own part of this mortgage-backed security, you're going to earn like maybe 3.5%. Right? You would get 4%, but you're going to charge, you're going to be charged a fee basically to have this mortgage backed security. So maybe you're earning 3.5%. So the interest they're paying will go into your profit margin here as the owner of the mortgage backed security. The other possible outcome of these houses is maybe somebody defaults. They stop making their housing payments. In that case, the house will be sold and the revenues will go to the people that own the mortgages. Since housing prices are always going up, that's going to be a good deal, right? This mortgage for this house right here may have been $100,000 when it began, but maybe the house now is worth $300,000. So if there's a foreclosure, you don't care. You're just going to see that profit continue to roll in. So as long as housing prices go up, mortgage-backed securities are a really good investment. Okay, So people like this because it's a good investment. It allows them to have a diversified piece of the housing market. And also, you don't need a whole bunch of money to do this. You got 500 bucks, you could buy a little piece of a mortgage-backed security. Hell, if you have a dollar, you might be able to buy a little piece of a mortgage-backed security. Okay? So these become really popular. The interest rate on these things might be like 3.5%. Right? They're going to kind of be aligned with the housing market in general. And you can kind of think of them as relatively low risk. So indeed, you're going to get plenty of people investing in these mortgage-backed securities. But these do not appeal to everyone, okay? You guys in this class, a lot of you are about to graduate or maybe you're a year away from graduating. When you get your first job, you're going to have that opportunity to invest in a 401k or maybe you invest in an IRA, something like that. Does this seem like something you want to invest in in a 401k or an IRA? An expected return of about 3.5%, relatively low risk. Not really, okay? When you're young, you want lots of risk. So you would like to invest in something that earns potentially much more return. And if it's risky, no big deal, right? When you're young, you can take on lots of risk because when you're 22 years old, you've probably got 40 years of working. So if you have one or two years of really bad investment returns, no big deal because you got 38 other years to cancel those out. So this is not going to really be a very viable investment strategy for you, even though it's on paper a pretty good deal. Also, what if you're retired? If you're retired, this might not be that good of a deal either because it still has some risk. You'd really like something with close to no risk if you're 80 years old. So this will appeal to some investors. Some will really like it, but it is not the type of risk that everyone prefers. But bankers hedge fund managers, various investors, figure out a way to take this mortgage-backed security and make it more palatable to more investors. Okay, so these traditional mortgage-backed securities, they're still a thing. You can still invest in these. There's nothing wrong with them. Right? They're reasonable investment options. They give investors a way to invest in the housing market. It's a good thing, okay? But... These do not appeal to a lot of people because, as we said, they are relatively low return. They're pretty low risk. So only so many people are going to invest in these uh, assets, these traditional mortgage-backed securities. In other words, all of everything in a traditional mortgage-backed security is the same. Okay, if you invest in this, and you, if I invest in this, and you invest in this, we're getting the same product, and maybe we don't want the same product. So investors, financial bankers, they figured out a way to appeal to more investors. What they did was they created something called a collateralized debt obligation or a CDO. Collateralized debt obligation. Okay, so just to recognize this term, this kind of sounds like a fancy term. Um, the obligation here, the debt obligation, is the fact that the mortgagers have to pay off their house, okay? So I own a house, you're in it right now, but I don't really own it, okay? I don't really own it, the banks own it. And I am obligated to continue making payments. I'm obligated to my debt, okay? Furthermore, my debt is collateralized because if I stop making payments, the bank will take my house as collateral. So mortgages are a form of collateralized debt obligations, okay? 
and I don't know exactly how we landed on this term, but CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, came to be uh, the term we used to explain this type of financial asset we're going to create next. So what we can imagine is starting with a traditional mortgage-backed security, we're going to break that thing up into three sections called tranches. Okay, so these are three tranches. Maybe a term you've seen. I learned from the big short that tranche is French for a portion of something. Okay, if you've seen the big short, they talked about this directly. Um, these tranches represent different levels of risk. Here's how it works. As people who have homes make their payments, the money is going to first go into that top level. So if you imagine a mortgage-backed security has a thousand homes in it and only one makes a payment in a month, that payment would go to the top tranche, okay? And that top tranche is gonna keep receiving payments until it is full. Kind of like dumping water into a tranche, okay? As you dump water in, the top one's gonna fill up first. But if it gets totally full, money will then start pouring into the second. And if the payments are really rolling in, if everybody makes their payments, then the bottom one will get full as well. So then we can think about the levels of risk that each of these would have. The top one is not very risky at all, okay? But the bottom one is pretty risky. So the interest rates that are connected to each of these tranches is going to vary. The top one is gonna have a really low interest rate, maybe 2%. And in many cases, the banks would actually guarantee this amount. You could pay a little bit extra to basically have insurance that would guarantee that you would receive your payments. The middle one might pay out something like 6%, okay? And the bottom one might have a return of 11%. So all we're really doing is changing the prioritization of the payments so that some people are receiving a riskier uh, CDO via the bottom tranche, and some are investing in the top tranche, which is less risky. This is gonna create an investment that more people like. As somebody who's relatively young, I'm, I'm 35 years old right now, so still relatively young, um, this bottom tranche looks really good to me because this is going to give me a return that's kind of like investing in stocks. It's higher risk, but it's higher expected return. So I like this bottom tranche. Now, like my parents who are older, they're not going to invest in the bottom one. They're not even going to invest in the middle one. But the top one looks really good, right? They can get 2% here in this top one, which is probably more than they could get in like a savings account or like a really safe CD or something. And then the middle one is middle ground. Some investors will like that too. So now what you've done is you've created an investment option that appeals to lots of people. Okay? So what this does is it creates increased demand for mortgage-backed securities. These are still mortgage-backed securities. Okay? Mortgage-backed securities just means securities backed by mortgages. These are mortgage-backed securities. The traditional mortgage-backed securities are still that. All of these are still available to invest in. But now you've got an option where lots of people are interested in investing in these. So let's think about the general equilibrium theory. If people really want the mortgage-backed securities, that's going to push way more money into this market. So if we think about the market for housing loans, we could think about this like a bond market, um, or we could think about it like a loan with funds market. I'm opting for the latter in this case. When those CDOs become popular, really when they first become created, they're an instant hit. And that creates way more desire to save money in this market, okay? So you can kind of think about like maybe my parents, all right? My parents would never have invested in a regular mortgage-backed security with that 3.5% return. They're going to put their money in like savings accounts, CDs, stuff like that, right? But now, because of the advent of these CDOs, 
they decide to buy the top tranche of a CDO. So if they put their money in a savings account, some of that might end up in the housing market, right? Because banks will have the money, they can lend it out how they see fit. But if they put their money in the top tranche of a CDO, it has to go to the housing market. That's what they're buying. They're buying pieces of houses. So you get this huge increase in savings in the housing market, reducing interest rates even further. Right? Remember, we talked about the trade deficit with China and how that drops interest rates. This is gonna drop interest rates even further. And so the result is in the housing market, just like we saw with the trade deficit in China, this is going to increase demand, leading to higher prices and higher quantities yet again, okay? This is exacerbating that problem. Housing prices went up about 95% between 97 and 2007. Here's one reason why, that trade deficit with China. Here's another reason why, the increased availability in investing for housing, okay? So we're pushing those housing prices up. Okay, so putting the ingredients together, we've got a trade deficit with China. We've got increased availability in investing in housing through those CDOs. The third key element we have is very low federal funds rates. Um, we're really putting together a perfect storm here, okay? Uh, in 2001, we had a recession. That recession um, was not a real bad one. It was caused perhaps in part due to like the dot-com bust. Um, websites were basically overvalued, like publicly traded websites were basically overvalued. We also had 9-11 that year, which uh, didn't cause this recession, but it did make the, the ill effects last a lot longer. And it certainly contributed to the desire to keep federal funds rates low. And the result of this 2001 recession and 9-11 and all that was the Fed dropped rates dramatically. And this is a simple one, okay? When interest rates are lower, just like we saw before, this is gonna increase demand for housing, driving up prices, okay? So maybe I'm not gonna buy a house at 7% interest, which would have been common in like 2000, but I would buy a house at 4% interest, which would be common in 2002, okay? So as those interest rates go down, you yet again see increased demand for housing, further leading to increasing housing prices and I'll show you those federal funds rates right now. So here are the federal funds rates uh, going back a couple of decades. And um, you can actually see that the federal funds rates used to be really high. So five and a half, six percent, something like that. And then in 2001, we had that recession. Uh, the end of 2001, of course, we had 9-11. And those impacts basically kind of similar to what we have right now, which is, you know, there's fear that the economy could be really bad in the future. So the Fed made the decision to keep interest rates really low. So you can kind of imagine in like 2003 here, you know that housing prices are going up. Um, you've seen it year after year. Um, and so you want to buy a house because interest rates are dirt cheap. Housing prices are always going up. And so people are going to buy houses like crazy. And you can see the Fed trying to rein it in here. They're trying to increase federal funds rates back up. But uh, essentially, they were too late. The economy was really getting overcooked during this period. So lots of people bought houses in this period right in here, um, leading to higher and higher housing prices. And you can kind of see that this, this is a, a big change, a, you know, a big inflection point, really, for the U.S. economy. We have not seen federal funds rates back to anywhere close to this level ever since the 2008 recession. And so, you know, the, the rules that we play by in 2021 are just very different than the rules that we had back in 2001. So I like to point this out because obviously it did increase housing prices. It did affect uh, likely the likelihood of a recession and a housing crisis. Um, but also it's one thing we really could have controlled. Um, there's not much we can do about CDOs. Those were reasonable investments. There's not a whole lot we can do about the trade deficit with China, except maybe impose tariffs, which, you know, would just hurt us. Um, but here is a case where if we had just kept federal funds rates higher, maybe we could have avoided this uh, great recession. And so it's certainly a learning point for the, uh, the Fed. Okay, so one more to add to the list here is baby boomers, if I could spell correctly. Um, baby boomers, as you probably know, were born uh, in that period after World War II. 
thinking about U.S. history, if you go back to 1929, which was the start of the Great Depression, we go right from the Great Depression, a couple years where the economy is recovering a bit in like 1940 or so, and then we go right into World War II. So like from 1929 to 1945, the world was really rough. It was a really rough time to be alive. People had very few kids, which meant that after World War II, people got really excited. They started having way more kids. Um, part of that has to do with the age of people. So, you know, maybe you would normally would have had a kid in 1935, uh, but you didn't because things were so bad. And so 1945, maybe you're like 37 years old and you decide to have a kid because you don't have any years left. So there's an explosion of people having kids like right at the tail end of the, their years of having that option. And then also you have people who are just getting way more optimistic. They're feeling good about life. So they start having way more kids. So we get this explosion. So between like 1945 and like 1965, you had lots of kids, right? Birth rates were really high in the U.S., way higher than they are now. Um, and so the result is these baby boomers are like, they're like between ages like 30 and 50 during that period where the economy was really starting to pick up. So that period of like 1995 to 2005, you can kind of recognize that baby boomers are going to sort of be in like their ideal ages, okay? And I don't know if I'm doing the math exactly right, but they're not yet retired, but they're all in the workforce, which means they're working really hard, earning a lot of money. So you got a big chunk of the population working, which is really good for the short-run economy. You also have these people that are having kids. They're buying big houses. They're moving out to the suburbs. This is when the suburbs really became a thing, okay? And so these are also going to create way more demand for housing. All right, what we saw is all four of these created demand for housing. You see it here as well, all right? So housing prices are gonna to continue to get beefed up. And finally, kind of as a result of these four, people become accustomed to it. Not only do we have these reasons for housing prices to go up, but now expectations are really inflated. So if we think about the housing market and we draw supply and demand, uh, this is one of my favorite simple little graphs that we have in economics that shows how expectations affect markets. And this was absolutely happening back in like 2005. I think it even still really happens today for the housing market. Everybody expects housing prices to go up. You've probably heard this, right? You, you've heard things like, if you're gonna live in Atlanta, you should buy a house now because you won't be able to afford it in the future. That's expectations driving demand today, okay? So if we're talking about like 2005, everybody's expecting housing prices to go up because they've been going up practically forever. And so the effects are demand increases because people want to buy houses now before they go up in price, right? If I think housing prices are going to double in 10 years, I want to go ahead and buy it now because that makes it a really good investment and way more affordable. So demand goes up. On the other side of the market, the supply, people selling houses, keep in mind, the, the supply is mainly just people like me, like regular homeowners, okay? Um, some supply is new houses. If you think about the supply of housing, some of it is new houses. Some of it is, you know, the creation of new neighborhoods and things like that. But most of the supply just comes from pre-existing houses. So what ends up happening during this period is people are so sure that housing prices are going to go up that they don't sell. So when they buy a new house, they keep the second one. They rent it out. They buy a beach house. So people end up with multiple houses. So on the supply side of the market, we get a decrease. Why sell your home if you think housing prices are going to continue going up? If I expect housing prices to go up, I want to sell in the future. I don't want to sell today. So supply decreases. And that also drives up housing prices. Okay? So basically what you can think of here is we've got a recipe for a disaster. We've got this huge bubble in the housing market, okay? And, and that's really what you're talking about here with number five. This is really the evidence of the bubble. A bubble is when prices go up merely because of speculation, merely because of expectations. And that is what we're seeing here, okay? So housing prices had been going up because of these four reasons. People became expected to that, which caused housing prices to go up even further inflating that bubble larger and larger. And this creates really a perfect storm in the housing market, which will create an entire crisis in the banking system.